and the screws keep getting tightened. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. I can remember earlier this past year, I think around March, April, as our world was going through this massive change because of the coronavirus. If you said anything against the virus or any of the science, which, by the way, if you if you look over time, it's been wrong a lot. I mean, it's been wrong a real lot. But there was a narrative out there. You know it. I know it. The virus is serious, but it's also been successfully used. And that's what really bothers me. How this virus was successfully used to increase the already enormous divisions among people. I get it that we have to do certain things when something like a a pandemic arrives on our shores. But we saw people use this virus to divide us. Face masks, do they work? Do they not? You can look, or you could, for a long time and find conflicting views about that, including actual studies done over a period of, I don't know, 40 some odd years by respected universities and research centers and hospitals all over the world on if these things really worked or not in slowing the spread of the virus. Now, the narrative became, if you thought it didn't, then big tech would suppress you. You're not allowed to speak against the science. What science? Science is always looking for the truth. And you don't stop when you find a truth that you like. That's pretty much what the regimes that are trying to control us have done. They have taken over the narrative of the virus. We have to close everything or we're all going to die. Number one, I worked in emergency management earlier this year. And I learned a lot during that time and I've kept in close contact with a number of people. We see this massive number of people that supposedly died. And I know many people have died either of, but mostly with, the virus. I've seen every explanation that we may have more deaths, maybe we don't. The numbers are, well, there was an old saying back in the 1980s. This politician has fuzzy math. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of fuzzy math in many of the numbers that we've looked at. Once again, if you know me, I am not denying the severity of the virus. I've had a couple of family members go through this. One had a very rough time. Very rough time. 41 years of age. No comorbidities except blood type lack of vitamin D and another of other issues. But he pulled through. Others barely knew they even had it. Only because they thought they had the common cold and they have children, they got tested. They're doing fine. We had people within my own family that if if someone mentioned the word coronavirus... Just just the mere mention of the word coronavirus. They thought it was a death sentence no matter what your age was. Because the media has hyped this thing to the maximum. And for a real cause. Number one, mainstream media, mainstream tech oligarchs and tech tyrants are not your friend. No, they're not. They look at themselves as the elite, as the elite core did around Hitler and Mussolini back in in the 1930s. The business people that knew who had the political power, and they wanted the money. It's funny how much of your soul you will sell for money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes, it is. Not money, but the love of money. 
And have we not seen that with corporations like Amazon, Walmart? They're the big benefactors of the coronavirus. The big chains did well. The local stores and restaurants have been devastated in many states. It's funny, St. Andrew Cuomo, the pious of New York. Sorry to use such an insulting term, but the man is a moron. The man is an idiot. The man killed people in his state and blames the rest of the world. He shoved sick people into into nursing homes, knowing and being told not to do it, but he did it anyway. Look at Pennsylvania. They did the same thing. But notice the the very strange director of health there. I'm not going to go into a whole, this person's insane. This person has mental illnesses. And this is the director of health in the state of Pennsylvania. Of course, he, she, or whatever, this guy who looks like an ugly girl, sorry to be so blunt, This man pretending to be a woman gets his mother out of a nursing home right before they put the sick patients in. Now, what does that tell you? What did this individual know? People in this country, particularly on the left, have used this virus to see how far their control can go. Instead of common sense approaches in dealing with this thing, we did draconian lockdowns. And how did they do? Well, I can tell you in one word, failure. Total and absolute failure. They didn't do anything. If you look at other parts of the world, see, whenever you lock down and keep people isolated and out of the sun and they're not eating right, I mean, face it, people in quarantine are not eating healthy diets the pizza places did marvelous business during this this pandemic hauling in pizzas to households all over the united states it's not a healthy diet they're not outside but you know the virus is not a living organism it doesn't need food to survive or anything it's not alive it is dna strands wrapped in a fat with protein receptors and in some some conditions can hang around a long time so we lock up at home and somebody goes out and then we bring the virus back to our locked up home and that's why St. Andrew Cuomo the Pious of New York was shocked when he found out that around 70% of the people getting infected were, were staying at home And he couldn't understand that it didn't work. And then when people got outside again, well, then the numbers started to go up. And then we'd lock back down. Then the numbers would go down. Then they would would go back up and down. We've never let this virus cycle through the healthy population. Instead, I am now convinced, and I've listened to some doctors that are very reputable, and some of the stuff they have been saying since back in April, May, and June have been right on the money. One guy said, if we had really gotten into vitamin D early on, this pandemic in the United States would already be over. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm a doctor and fully agree, but it makes sense. One of the individuals that I know that when he first suspected the coronavirus, they upped their vitamin D intake immediately and zinc and instead of even with some issues like asthma they came through pretty fast there's a lot about this that has been used for politics it gave us the excuse for the mail-in ballot nonsense I don't care what Google says. I don't care what Twitter says. I don't care what Facebook says. I don't care what any of the tech tyrant Hitlers that run this tech infrastructure have to say, including YouTube. I don't care what you think. You have an agenda and you don't care about the truth. You care about your power, your money, your prestige, and your control. It's the thing called the pendulum. You may be at the top of your game today, but you know, pendulums have a bad habit of swinging the other direction, and you may not want to 
it, it, history has proven over and over again about a pendulum. What the left has tried to do, what the tech tyrants have tried to do, what everybody tries to do, any despot in the, in the history of the world has always used division to get power and to get control. The Reichstag fire in Germany in the 1930s. Adolf Hitler had been elected chancellor, but he didn't have a whole lot of power. But after that fire and blaming his enemies, they gave him virtually unlimited power. In 1939, Hitler wanted to invade Poland. So what did he do? He faked Polish soldiers attacking Germans. It was really Germans attacking Germans. Uh, for the newsreels, of course. So he would have the excuse and the German people's backing to march into Poland. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer has been the despot's way of doing business for millennia. The Roman Empire divided to conquer. Every despot group divides to conquer. Right now, American people are more divided than ever against each other because of politics. You look at people like the type that run and and work with National Public Radio. They get caught by Project Veritas talking about they think that conservatives should have their children taken away from them. This is an actual person, big person in NPR. You can watch the video. Conservatives need to have their children taken away and the children sent to re-education camps. Conservatives need to be blacklisted. Some have said conservatives, Trump supporters, should not be, they should be on the no-fly list. The elite want to travel without the rabble of conservatives on the aeroplane with them. They want to throw you into the tech ghettos or just throw you out entirely like they did Parler and others. The virus has been used to divide us for those that would say, well, you know, wait a minute. Some of the stuff we've done is wrong. You want people to die. They come right back. You want people to die, don't you? You don't care. Wear your mask or you'll kill me. Yet their science... Once again, the party of science uses only the science that they they selectively use. A lot of science that we've seen over the years that has proven itself was discarded and tossed to the side so we could get mail-in ballots and control. Two weeks ago, St. Andrew Cuomo the Pious of New York was talking about, we've got to shut things down, or people are, it's just, it's horrible, we've got to shut it down. Of course, that was when there was the possibility the election might get overturned. Now suddenly, uh, we, we have to open up, or there'll be nothing to open up. If he hadn't figured that out in the last six months, where has he been? Like most people in his position in life, in a bubble. And he frankly doesn't care if your business succeeds or not. He just wants his power and he wants his money. And because he and Mayor de Blasio, who danced the night away on New Year's Eve with his wife and nobody else could go out except him and his wife, they watch Rome burn while they play their fiddles. And here's the worst part. Now they're going to want to come to the new Biden administration. <laughs> And they want money to fix the problems they created from the states that didn't screw up. I hate to be so blunt about this, but I I just wanted to get this off my chest, that we have been divided. And even Christians are divided. I've never seen this nation divided as much as we are today. And maybe social media is to blame. I don't know talk about that in a bit 
I bought back a good friend, the Reverend Dr. Timothy Gales, and he, he's had an unusual life. He worked on Wall Street for many years, made pretty good money back in the 90s, a young guy at that time, starting a family, but the Lord really got a hold of him, and he ended up studying for the ministry. And after he got all that done and became ordained, he had the problem, how do I raise a family? And he got a call from a friend to send him back to Wall Street. And for a season, he was back making enough money to take care of his family and needs, commuting from New Jersey. One day, his world changed. We know that is September the 11th, 2001. As he came out of the buildings in lower Manhattan and watched the flames coming out of the World Trade Centers and people jumping to their death right in front of his eyes. He escaped that day. Took him, what, nine hours, if I recall, from his his testimony. Nine hours to get home from that. And it changed his life. Many ways, things like that can scar us, but God can use those scars for, for good and build upon them. And he understood his ministry for the first time. Understanding how to be prepared for those difficult times in our life. So my question is, I begin our time together uh, is, is there timothy dr dr gales is there any way we could be divided any more than we are today um yeah actually we can be i mean we are extremely divided on multiple levels uh but i think the biggest division that we are actually going to see is a division of truth and error. Now, we already see that in the common cults and in certain Christian groups, Mm -hmm. but there are slight errors, one being like the rapture, one being um, this health and wealth gospel. These divisions give you a false hope and a false Christianity. They all keep you from understanding suffering, and they don't want to suffer. The the escapist mm-hmm. doctrine, the idea of you don't polish brass on a sinking yep. ship, um, you know, these escapist doctrines are to avoid suffering. The health and wealth gospel is to avoid suffering. Suffering is looked at as something evil, bad, to be avoided, and God's going to save you from it. When in reality, we don't have a theology of suffering. And what that means is God works through our suffering and in our suffering to prepare us to shape and mold us into his image and he relates to it because guess what he suffered so when you talk about preparing for suffering most christians in america can't handle that because they're not expecting to suffer they, they're not expecting you to go through a tribulation period mm-hmm. in this world. You know, we might get sick. We might get cancer or die. I mean, that, they understand that. But even then, I have to say, even then, they're not sure how to handle it because they're like, well, oh, I got cancer. This is the worst thing the Lord could ever give. To, how come I got this, you know? And they don't know how to suffer well. Yeah. And we, the early church was taught how to suffer because they did it all the time. But they also saw that in their mortality, they were working for their immortality. Yes. It was building treasures in heaven through suffering. So what does Jesus say? He tells us that when you are weak, then you are strong. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. It has been given unto you in Philippians not only to believe on his name, but to suffer for mm-hmm. his sake. Mm-hmm. Okay? We, we, we conveniently leave those things out. We don't like to talk about suffering. If I were to tell you, you know, if I were to tell you, you know something, um, the reason God allowed you to be a quadriplegic like Johnny Erickson Tata or others yeah. is because he's going to bear so much fruit through that. That's, you know, we run around and say God has a wonderful plan for your life. Mm-hmm. What if his plan for your life is that? Are you going to think it's wonderful? Are you well, going to submit to that? You know, the Bible, we, a lot of people have you know made a lot of this one verse. You know, I have great plans for you, says the Lord. You know, I, I and it's true. He does. 
But we, we have this misunderstanding that great plans mean a nice car and a nice house and a great life and a big church. And, and our, the great plans are just great things in an earthly sense. And we don't understand. I, I argue with myself, and you'll, maybe you'll understand this. I've done well in a lot of my secular career as a broadcaster and, and having listeners and all the good stuff that goes with it. And the Lord called me into ministry, and, I, and I have, I've actually, from the perspective of the church background that I ended up in, did very well compared to most of my other brothers you know, in the churches that they were building. And But they weren't huge churches. I probably was bigger than most. But it was not as big as, you know, like First Presbyterian or a First Baptist or some monstrous, you know, Lutheran church, depending on what part of the country you live. And for a number of years, I felt that I was a failure. Well, my church only has 100 people. Or this new mission only has 52 people. Or, you know, this little one I'm trying to help, we got to 36 people. You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And you put your heart and your soul in it. You're mailing out letters. You're doing everything you can possibly do. And the church doesn't seem to be growing the way we think it should grow. And then it dawned on me one day. It is not the size of the numbers of people. It's the size of their commitment to me, of those people. And it dawned on me that when I would look at that congregation of 100 people, There are only three or four that I ever really worried about. You know what I mean? When I would say that, you know, are they really a part of the brethren of Christ or are they they just here for the wrong reasons? I I didn't have that insecure feeling as a pastor. I felt that they, these were true believers in this church. and, And there was such a peace about that, that with this small group, there's more income coming into the church than churches three and four times the size of the one I had. They were supporters. They were doers. They. It wasn't the 80-20 rule, which we all know about, 20% do 80% of the work. Right. It, it was like 100% rule, 100% or, or 90% were doing 90% of the work. It was a different dynamic in that church. Right. And, and it gave me a better feel that, no, I wasn't a failure. Yeah, no. I may have been used to having thousands of listeners back in my disc jockey days, but my ego needed to be deflated. I'm not I'm not John MacArthur standing before seven thousand people behind a pulpit. I'm sorry. I wish I could be, but maybe my ego would be too stroked if I did. And right. and so Well that is a problem with the Christianity today, right? Because we measure success by numbers. And the fact of the matter is you're exactly right. Uh, when I was when I was in seminary, I remember going to churches, there was a few people in the church. I had a friend of mine also yeah. who was starting a church he had maybe 11 people yeah. he tried doing it for about a year almost a year and a half mm-hmm. and finally he just went I, I no more and he left he said i can't do this not growing and he left yeah. and he went back to uh, to his old church and i was there and his pastor looked at him and he said you mean you left 11 sheep unattended yeah he goes you go back there and you make them the best fed and the most loved 11 sheep that you can do. Yeah. And he and when he did, he actually did go back there and it did start to grow mm-hmm. as he fed them. It does. You know, but we give up. We think I'm a failure, Lord. You know, I, I've only got 11 people here. What am I going to do? And he says, love them. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Whether you've got two, one, two, twenty, feed my sheep. Yeah. Because the natural byproduct of well-fed sheep is that they reproduce. And that's God's job. Your job is to feed them, yeah. not to run out there and to do all your demographics and all your – listen, just feed the sheep the word of God and he will bring the increase. And we think we're bringing the increase, and there lies the problem. That's right. That's the bad part. You know, and that's pride and arrogance on our part, right? One of the things that's good about doing this radio show on shortwave, the feedback you're going to get is going to be hard. To, you'll never know how many people listen. And so I don't know if we're talking to 50 people right now or 50,000. There's just no way to know. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear from some, but there is no... There's no mathematical formula. There's no rating service for international shortwave. It does not exist. 
the what they call the people meter, which is the way they measure. That's a, I'll have to tell you. I'll explain that some other day. Doesn't really matter. But those that are selected, they carry this little thing the size of a pen with them. It detects what radio station they're listening to by a certain sound. And so that's how they're rating radio stations. They don't do it for shortwave. I may be wasting my time uh, talking to 30 people, or maybe I'm not. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. I still feel that I need to put the program together with the best of my ability, the best of my talents. I cannot shortchange what listeners I have. And the podcast, well, there's definitely not thousands listening, and it's measured in small numbers, but it's important to those numbers that listen. What does the Lord tell you about, you know, what your ministry is in reaching people? Absolutely. He tells me that every person is his, created in his image and likeness. And no matter if I have one or, or, or 1,000, um, I, I love on them mm-hmm. as Christ would. And I teach them and I treat them as if they're a king or a queen or, you know, you come into my office. I always tell people, blessed are the flexible for them shall not yes. be broken. That's my my standard in my ministry. Mm -hmm. So I tell them no matter what I'm doing, I said it's a divine interruption. You need me. You come into my office, whatever. I I will stop everything and give you all of my attention and and help you in any way I can Uh, and, and feed them. Have them grow in the faith. I don't give people platitudes. I will not do that. And, and I'll yep. give them truth and I'll do it in love, but I'll also teach them and I will genuinely care for them. If I tell you that I'm going to walk with you in your Christian walk, I'll do it. And I, I, there was, I'll give an example. of one guy who, who was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. He worked at a job where I was. He was the maintenance guy. And he said, you know, he, he wasn't really a Christian, but I started talking to him about the Lord. Mm-hmm. And he said, look, I'm, I'm dying. And I said, I know you are. I said, but I'll walk with you through this. Yeah. Well, about four months later, as he got worse and worse, he laid there in the, in the hospice bed and he turned around. He looked at me and he said, you know something, Pastor Tim, mm-hmm. you really did. You kept your promise. You've yeah. walked me through Absolutely. this entire time. And I said, you bet I did. Mm. And, I, and because that's what the Lord would have me do. And that's what he does with us. Every single human being is important. Every human being is God's image okay yes. and yep. they are created they, they, but they have value dignity and worth by virtue of their creator not the government not any of mm-hmm. not any king or queen yeah. they have virtue of their creator value dignity and worth and need to be treated as such i tell this to many ministers it's not about you yeah. it's not about you, you need to fade away and let Christ take over. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. So don't sit there and think you need to have your skinny jeans and your tattoos and your your hair all, you know, molded back and, and get up there, play guitar. Listen to me. You need to know what it is to sit and hold the hand of somebody dying. Yes. Somebody have lost everything that they've ever had. Somebody who's been betrayed and they're completely Mm -hmm. alone now Mm -hmm. or homeless. That's ministry. Forget all this television stuff that people think, well, I'm a successful minister because I have a television show. Yeah, whoopee. I've got all these people singing in my congregation. Yeah, and, 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 and beware of the ones that are selling you the apocalypse chow. Right. You know, right. I mean, and all that th- stuff, this stuff right. will get you 20. Well, if, 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 if the tribulation lasts 25 years, so will my macaroni and cheese. I mean, it's right. it's, it's <laughs> crazy. You know, there are things that I call prudent prudent preparations right. uh, we used to talk in, in back in emergency management days it's called your your, your go bag it, and and what that means is enough prescriptions enough information cash and everything to last you for about 72 hours just in case a tornado comes through your neighborhood and you got to leave in a hurry you, you want to have the ability of having the basic necessities with you until help can arrive. It, it may take a little time. I've seen it happen before. I've seen tornadoes hit in, in where I worked at, and the people were displaced for about a week. 
and then in a couple of days with, you know, they didn't have any money, uh, they needed prescriptions filled, so basic stuff. That's called being reasonable and prudent. But you don't have to be over the top saying, well, I got mine taken care of for the next seven years, and it's all hidden in my basement. Well, it won't be hidden in your basement for long when people realize you ain't, you ain't, you're not starving to death. You got food. They'll find it. People <laughs> don't, right. you know, you're, you're, be, you're building, you're building your house upon the sand. Come on. This is not scriptural. The rapture is not scriptural. When we talked about it yesterday, we might mention it in the next half hour. I don't want to get into it too much. All I can tell you is just be prepared for what God has in store for you and I. And it may not be in ministry. We don't know if we're going to have any respite out of all this nonsense. It could continue on this path that we're heading on, you know, where the people are kept, you know, like, look, the Roman Empire sums it up well. And this is where I think the United States is heading to on many levels. Bread and circuses. Bread and circuses. We keep the divided people divided to control them. Uh, We don't let the Christians get too vocal. And that's why, friends, you and I have got to start slipping into the places that God has called you to be. And when we come back after this break, I want to get into that topic even more. Where can we go? How do we begin to... We talked about in the first part of the week. What are the little first steps? What are our first baby steps in getting out of this mess called the world that we live in? This is Truth to Ponder, and we need to take a break. When we come back, we've got some more. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. The eyes of the beholder. Shalom Aleichem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. Now in the ancient Middle East, eyes were everything. The women were veiled. So the only thing you could really see were their eyes. So back then, everything was riding on the eyes. Forget the nose job, forget the lipstick, forget the rouge, but go out and buy tons of Visine and cartons of Maybelline. All they saw were the eyes. So in the book of Genesis... The maiden Leah is described as being weak-eyed, which can mean either one whose vision is impaired or one who isn't beautiful to look at. Now, the connection's profound and biblical. It's the link between seeing and being. Messiah said the same thing. He said, if your eye or your seeing is good, then your whole being will be filled with light. Paul said it a different way. He said, all things are impure to the impure. In other words, if you're always seeing impurity, you yourself are impure. But if you see the light, then you yourself will be filled with light. Spiritually speaking, you are what you see. The way you look is the way you will look. The way you look at the outside is the way you will look from the outside. The way you look at others is the way you will look to others. You'll become the way you see. So if you always see the worst and impure in everything, you yourself will become impure and the worst person you can become. But if you always look for and see the best and the beautiful and the hand of God and the face of God in everything, Everything, then you yourself will become the best and most beautiful person you can become. Your choice, my friend. Look beautifully and you'll look beautiful. See God in everything and you too will become beautiful because beauty truly is in the eyes of the beholder. Want more? Ask for the children of Leah. Now, what if you could receive daily vitamins guaranteed to strengthen your spiritual walk with God? A six-month supply for free. You can. Sapphire's daily spiritual vitamins for a victorious walk with God and updates on Israel, prophecy, and the incredible, the mystery of the temple doors, all free. You'll love it. How do you get all these free gifts? Easy. Just remember Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua, and dial it. That's all you do. Just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. You'll be blessed, but call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. And it can actually spread salvation around the world for very little through shortwave radio from the Arctic Circle to Israel. It's amazing. It's like sending a billion tracks around the world. Just call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or write me direct. The Nice Jewish Boy at Box 1111, Lodi. L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. It's a nice Jewish boy. It's 1111 Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Till next time, this is Jonathan Khan saying Shalom Aleichem. Peace be to you, my friend, and Messiah. Yeshua Tenu, our salvation.
This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of the Thursday edition of Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. This has been an exciting week. We've talked about a lot of things. Yesterday, I spent some time trying to reacquaint many of us in Scripture. We hear things in messages, sermons, on the radio, even from me. But I urge you to get into what the Bible actually says. There is nothing wrong with putting down your cell phone or turning off your computer and picking up the Bible. Now, if need be, and you need a good copy of the Scripture, you can you can get that and, and read it on your screen if you want. But how about turning off the world for just an hour? This week, not even in the day, for the week. How about start today and read 15 minutes of Scripture? 15. I mean, you're able to do, I don't know, three, four hours online, so many or more. If you have a younger person in your house and you're letting them play video games for six hours, tell them that, you know, for every hour you want to play in the video game, how about five minutes of reading scripture this afternoon? You know, 25 minutes, that's five hours. But you know, the five minutes per hour that they get uh, will probably do more good than anything you've done all week in banging on their head. The Word of God is life-changing. I, I, I know it, I believe it, and I, I need to discipline myself. We all need to rediscipline because we've been so distracted by the things of this world. There's a beautiful hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I, we just got to take our eyes off the world. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the light of his wonderful word. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Maybe it's time that the world becomes dim and and the light of God shines in us more than it ever has before. We do this radio program and podcast as a in an effort to help you get through this labyrinth of misinformation, deception, despair. You know, my faith is not built in my politics. We talk about politics. And yeah, when I vote, my vote tries to reflect this as best as I can, uh, the values that I hold. But in all my 49 years of voting now, um, I've been disappointed about 80% or more of the time. I mean, don't put your hope in princes. Don't put your faith in the sons of man. Don't put your, we're not going to bring in God's kingdom at the ballot box and we're not going to win it in Facebook. It's time to get off the wrong battlefield. It's time to stop fighting the things that God has never called us to fight to begin with. I mean, you can argue. I I get people, I had this one example. I talked about Noah and the ark. The time came that the ark door closed. The rains came. And the people came from town trying to get into the ark. God sent wild animals to tear them apart. Their time was over. And I I said, you know, just like with Facebook, maybe the time is, I believe the time is really over. And here's why. And then somebody argued, wait, wait wait a minute, you know, you you need need to right up to the door. No, not to the door closed. Their window had closed long before that. Noah started building the ark, and he told the people that God had told him to do this, and they mocked him, and they laughed at him. At that point, God gave them over to a double mind and a reprobate mind, because in the times of Noah, the sins of the time of Noah are the sins of our society today. We are in, and the world's not the first time, we're in the times of like Noah. It's always that kind of sin. Now, whether this is the great tribulation coming or a big tribulation coming, God is not bothered to tell me and give me, <laughs> and don't tell me Scripture says it's now. We'll, we'll, it's, it doesn't. But it's not going to be a fun time if you're not prepared. And this guy said, you know, well, you know, he should. I said, nowhere in the Scripture did Noah put down the tools and stop building the ark for endless times to try to re, re-persuade everybody. It's kind of like going back to Facebook and arguing. In the electronics business, when you go to buy parts for a place, you can argue with a parts man behind the counter all day long. And it's like wrestling with a pig in the mud. The pig loves it. 
And sometimes wrestling with the spirit of Antichrist is the same thing. It's kind of like going to King Agrippa. I'm almost persuaded, but I can't be. And I think that we need to begin to walk away from this world and get away from some really bad theology that's out there. Tim, I've got Dr. Timothy Gale still with me, and I'm sorry that I, I spoke for so long, because I, I, I hate to waste our time, but I just, just felt the anointing of God to share that. The true church is not going to be that prestigious building much longer. Would you agree with that premise? Yeah, and it never was. The church is us. Um, and, and as we gather together, you know, well, let me ask you a question. When the Christians mm-hmm. in the early church were in the catacombs, caves, was that still the church? You oh, betcha. absolutely. Absolutely. You betcha. Because the church is us. And that's that's something we really have to think about. As we're getting into these tougher times, okay? And I'm like anybody mm-hmm. else. I love to see a nice, beautiful church building, the architecture, all of that stuff. It's beautiful. But those things are going to remain and and they're going to be filled with with the worldly I'll use that term worldly Christians or people who believe they're Christians, but they're really just the social clubs of the world. Um, they're going to have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And and the true Christians, those who, who truly believe and hold the faith once and for all delivered to the saints are going to be meeting in other places, whether it's going to be farm ha- buildings mm-hmm. or the mm-hmm. woods or caves or whatever it might yeah. be. But they're going to be strong and they're going to be powerful because they're not relying on the things of the world anymore because you can't. You're going to be relying on Christ and you're going to know him and you're going to know one another and you're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us like the early church did. You know, too often we're comfortable. We go to these churches in town. We have the things of the world. But we've got to understand that when all those things are taken away, what do you have? I said something to a friend of mine who's in a very big, big liturgical church, and I said, you know, it is beautiful, and I love the the, the chanting. I said, but yeah. if I were to remove the Holy Spirit tomorrow, what would change? Mm-hmm. And he just sat there, and he goes, that's a really good question. And I said, right. I mean, so what we're looking at, okay, is – the ability to be able to suffer well for Christ, because that's coming. And I think very, very, very few Christians even contemplate that, are even prepared for it. It's not a question of arguing the doctrines of the faith with the, mm-hmm. with unbelievers. You know, the greatest apologetic will be love, but a love that's willing to give its life for Christ or for somebody else, a love that is going to be real, that is what the world will see when the time comes. And I have to say, martyrdom is already here in the world. The Christians in China are being martyred. All over the world, they're being martyred, the Middle East. And it's here, okay? Listen to me. It's here. It just hasn't been initiated as much Mm -hmm. as you're going to see. And God gives. He God gives people the grace to go through it but some people are chosen for martyrdom and i'm just going to add you know we don't know this it's in god's hands but i'm going to say this if you're one of the ones chosen for martyrdom yeah are you prepared are you prepared to say not my will but his be done and go through it i'm like anyone else i don't want to suffer i don't like pain you know i'm like c.s lewis who who said a simple thing is a toothache can call your whole theology into question you betcha and we don't like that pain but this is a time martyrdom was looked at in the early church as as a blessing really it was yes a, yes it was it, it was we a forget gift. That. it was god if you were a martyr i mean god had blessed you with the privilege of being a martyr for the sake of christ we see in the book of revelation the martyrs are under the under the the altar crying out, how long, O Lord? How long before you end all this and bring justice to the world? Oh, yeah. And and these are the martyrs. So we have, we have martyrology books which talk of the martyrs all over the place. 
see, we're afraid, and we're afraid of what martyrdom I might suffer. Well, that's yep. not in your hands. No, it isn't. That's in God's hands. You know, and, look, if, if you and I both had to go through, and I've and I, I wrestled with this several years ago, to watch the Coptic Christians mm-hmm. on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. They're wearing their orange jumpsuits, and they had their heads cut off. There were a number of them there, and none, zero, renounced their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, think about this for a moment. This, this Really, because I wrestled, how could they do that? Because they didn't do it. <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit through them did it. This is what we forget. It's not up to us. It's up to God. And and you know what? It's a witness because that's what martyr means. It means witness. Did you know out of those Coptic Christians, there was one African man, mm-hmm. the, uh, the black man, and he was not a Christian prior to that. He became a Christian there with them when the Muslims came. And he said, I, I'm a Christian, too. And they took him because of what he saw in them. OK, the same thing is what happens in martyrdom. We, we are a witness to others. You know, I have a Coptic Christian friend and he said, are you Americans? You guys aren't even Christians. I said, well, what do you mean? Yes, we are. He said, you have no idea what it is to, to know that when you get up in the morning and you and you exit your front door, mm-hmm. you may not come home simply because you're a Christian. And he said, we tattoo a small Coptic cross on the wrist of our daughters mm-hmm. when they're young because they could be taken by the Muslims as sex slaves. And, and, and what will happen is that little mark on their wrist, that Coptic cross, will be burned off. Mm. But they'll always see a scar and they'll know we teach them, you will always remember you are a Christian. You know, there are so many well-meaning and and i say that people that put out uh books and cds and and dvds and christian music in this hope of reaching the young people i've heard that for since i was since i was a young person uh half a century ago and we have substituted the word of god the teaching and being bought into the faith with pizza parties and sock hops and all kind of weird stuff even back in our day you know movies and in other words it was party time Uh, Mm -hmm. in the summertime we went swimming you know and and we you know we we have this you know someone's got to say grace over the food and a little bit of you know it's kind of like a pizza party with a tiny side of jesus and 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 we all fell into this the, the, Mm -hmm. the church has been deceived into this we have substituted the meat of the word of god for junk food yep and and we have and and now you got music today and here's something i want you to understand this in no uncertain terms all over the united states over the last several years there's been this wave of new FM radio stations that play contemporary Christian music. And they say all the right things. You follow all the right things. And they play this mass-marketed music for millennials and Generation Z. And this is supposed to be Christian music. And if you're a baby boomer or... or um, and, and What's the other group that came after us? I can't remember. But that some want to feel young again. And it's all youthful. It's all upbeat. It's all emotional. But it's littered with unbiblical truth and even extra biblical claims that are not true from the Word of God. Millions of people are turning on these so-called Christian radio stations who can be carried to nothing more than unvetted guest speakers and pulpits. I mean, it's like we don't know what they're going to say, but they sing it. And all this bad theology, all about personal experience, and instead of proclaiming the holiness of God. You know, when when I think about hymns, and I'm going to share before we get off this program today, uh, just one verse of a a hymn that we forget. We, We... instead of proclaiming fear and holiness as the old hymns did we cater to the defeated 
and we we encourage the non-believer to not necessarily have to change their belief. It's a watered down fake gospel, and 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 this is what so many of these rock and roll groups have become, and they air on such outfits as like K Love, Air One Radio, and they 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 feature all these worldly looking groups in their tight uh, with short you know skirts and tight jeans. And and they're just wailing into these microphones. All this bread and circuses to the church. They are the bread. And, they are the circus to the church. Keeps them from getting into real theology too. What's going to happen to the real church? That's my question. Right. Well, the real church is going to survive. <laughs> the real church is going to have fortitude, and it's going to have coraggio, courage, because it's mm-hmm. going to come from Christ. And if your spiritual life is deep, you're mature in your faith through the hymns, the chants, whatever it may be in the Word of God, when in the teaching, if you have a maturity, you're going to be able to stand in the midst of what's coming, okay? But if you are one who's just been drinking milk rather than eating meat, having a tall glass of milk every week. Or powdered milk. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, or yeah, right, or uh, what did I used to call it? Uh, lactose Christians, right? <laughs> lactose intolerant Christians, right, right. So you're going to have, you know, that you're not going to be able to withstand anything. All right, well, you're going to wanna... fold, you're going to cave, you're going to give in, you're going to conform, you're going to deny, you're going to be the modern day Donatists. You're going to be the yeah. ones that yeah. that say, "Oh, hey, you know, I'll I'll follow the Lord, but I got to protect my own life." Jesus said this. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. Yeah. And he who loses his life for my sake will save it. These multi-million dollar corporations that pretend to be giving us, you know, Christian faith and music, and it's all wonderful, and it's all godly, and it's all going to save our kids, and it's all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. These kids would, would deny Christ, too many of them, I believe, in a heartbeat. I've watched them do it. Oh, they went to the church. Oh, they got baptized. Oh, they did this. And now they just, you know, live for the world. They stopped going to church. Premarital sex is their standard. And it's all good. Mm-hmm. And it's it's hymns. I'm going to compare one little verse of a of a hymn, of a contemporary song that we, you would hear on K-Love or any of those, I'm sorry, deceptive. I, I, they, they're, they're warping. They're ruining you. They're ruining you. Listen to these words and then listen to a verse of a hymn from hundreds of years ago. That's singing about the same thing. You're all right. You're following the same topic. And here's how it goes. I'm just a breath away. I'm just a step away from losing my faith today. Falling off the edge today. I need a hero to save my life. That's the, that's the entire verse. Okay. What, what's the hero? They don't. It's all about me. I'm a breath away. I'm in. I'm in despair. But something's going to make me feel real good, and everything's going to be all right because I'm going to have a hero. Whatever. We don't even define who the hero is. They don't dare say Jesus, and I don't think Jesus like, like is going to be a there. Comic book hero, right? Yeah, it's like a yeah, like that's a that's a song right there. A comic book hero, right? I'm falling off the edge. I'm losing my faith. Uh, why are you losing your faith? Are you outside of God's word? I mean, you don't lose your faith unless you never had it sometimes to begin with. It can be shaken, but it doesn't get lost. And you're not that close to the edge. If you are and you're scared, then the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in you. So let's compare that to another uh, hymn of the faith. This one, I think, is uh, talking on the same topic. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits in consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and with the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Does that sound a little bit different to you? <laughs> That's right. The church the church victorious, right? Where where is that church? Where is that church? It's in heaven. Uh, it's, it's, it's the martyred church, the ones that suffered, the ones that counted the world. Go read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, 
the heroes of the faith. They were sawn in half. They were cut in sunder. They they were they they shed their blood. Okay, they didn't just say, "Hey, I'm afraid I'm gonna you know teeter totter a little today. I need a hero." No, they were uh-huh. thrown in burning hot iron bulls so that they would scream. They were scorched. They were they were lit up on fire to light up the the parties in yeah. Rome. Yeah. Okay, you know, how many people, how many Christians in the Middle East, in Iraq, I believe it was a few years back, there was five children that were taken captive, brought out in the middle of the town, and they were between the ages of 14 and 7, I think. And they were told to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ and accept Islam. Do you know, at that age... Five of them, not one of them, renounce their faith knowing they're going to get their heads cut off and all five of them got their heads cut yes. off. Not one of them renounced their faith. Now, you come to this country and you take five teenagers in a youth group and how many of them are going to go through with it and get their head cut off? You know, I, I look at the words of such hymns and <clears throat> I'm not going to have time to really get into these uh, these wonderful lyrics written by people of old that that faced difficult times in their life you know built on the rock the church does stand even when steeples are falling crumbled have spires in every land bells are still chiming and calling calling the young and old to rest but above all the soul's distress longing for rest everlasting these are not hymns of happiness and these are not hymns of just wonderfulness and all about me These are hymns about the church, the buildings crumbling and falling apart, but the bell still rings out, the faithful word of God. Give us some closing thoughts before we have to leave it for today. You know, our strength is not in the things of this world or the world. John tells us that. Love not the world or the things in the world. You know, nowhere in Scripture does it say that God loves the the ones that are blessed and happy and healthy and wealthy and wise he says he chastises those whom he loves he brings you through tribulation if you're going through tribulation it's because he loves you and his hand is upon you and he reminds you that his power is made perfect in your weakness it's not you but Mm -hmm. it'll be him in you to the glory of God the Father the angels will witness it The heavenly, victorious church will witness it and cheer you on. And we need to be ready for that. This is not a game. And this isn't a feel-good message that we go to. It's a time to build our spiritual life for eternity. For eternity. Because in his light, we see light. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Remember that. Timothy, I want to thank you for being on the program me again today, Dr. Reverend Dr. Timothy Gales. I look at the clock on the wall. We are just about out of time again. I've got a special program I hope is going to come together for for Monday and another one for tomorrow. And uh, we're trying to get all the finishing touches. I am traveling this weekend to Texas to to actually do some church work. I'll tell you about that when I get back next week. Do you believe in the work of this ministry? If you do, would you let a friend know? Uh, Would you consider maybe supporting it? You can go to our website. You can do it from there, truth2ponder.com. Some people already have. Or if you prefer the U.S. mail, it's real simple. Just Truth to Ponder. Make your check payable to Ancient Word Radio. The address is 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263. That's our little P.O. box, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, Georgia, zip code 30537. That's 30537. God bless until tomorrow. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.